Hello, everyone. This is Jason Zaidema from ICMA and NAMA. I'm so glad that uh, so many of you are with us today. I know the numbers will, uh, will grow as everyone's logging in in the next uh, minute or two. Today, I have the, uh, the great privilege to be joined by Dr. Helen Sampson, who is uh, the director of the Seafarers International Research Center at Cardiff University. Welcome, uh, Dr. Sampson, to this conversation. Thank you very much. As a brief bio, Helen Sampson joined the Seafarers International Research Center in 1999. In 2003, she was appointed as CERC's director at CERC, Professor Sampson's research interests have developed in relation to multinational crewing, training, women seafarers, the impact of changing technology on seafarers work, issues, issues of regulation, family life, globalization, and seafarer health and safety. And these research interests have translated into numerous articles and books, a bibliography of which can be found on CERC's website. A few short months, months ago, Professor Sampson published with Neil Ellis uh, an article relating to some previous research. And the article, very helpfully, uh, digesting that previous research was called Stepping Up the Need for Proactive Employer Investment in Safeguarding Seafarers' Mental Health and Well-Being. That article and the research behind it merits careful consideration by all those with an interest in seafarers' welfare, especially in the context of the COVID pandemic. Welcome, Professor Sampson, to this conversation. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, Jason. It's a pleasure to be here and um, to be talking about what I think is a particularly crucial topic at this time. Um, uh, I'm uh, going to try to describe the research that we did using a few um, short slides and um, uh, Basically, I'm going to try to cover just what our aims were, the research questions that we addressed, um, what we, um, how we did that, and, uh, and, and, you know, some of what we found. Um, and at oh. the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll, I'll um, indicate where fuller um, details can be found. Yeah, I was just going to say that. So we'll, we'll dive into the presentation and then afterwards we can save our questions. But if anyone has any questions while Professor uh, Sampson is presenting, you can pop them in the question box and we can come back to them uh, when she is done her presentation. So we'll have a few slides for the first half or so of this hour. And then uh, for the second half, we will uh, open it up for uh, uh, questions from those listening in. So uh, please uh, guide us through the slides, Professor Sampson. Okay, so um, if you could maybe show the next slide, please, Jason, that'd be great. Um, we, ha we had three main research questions um, that we wanted to investigate when we, when we undertook this research. Um, there, was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of publicity in the maritime press um, uh, prior to us undertaking the research um, uh, look, uh, about the um, mental health situation for seafarers. And I think it particularly all sort of boiled down to something that had come, come out from the UK P&I Club. Um, a couple of years earlier, um, and that had kind of like stimulated uh, quite a lot of concern um, in, in some of the media outlets. And we wanted to know um, whether, in fact, behind that concern, was it just one or two people publishing a lot, or was it um, actually a, a widespread concern um, amongst key stakeholders? So that was the first thing that we wanted to establish. Um, we also wanted to um, actually our seafarers rather than anybody else, um, what they felt um, on board undermined their mental health or supported it. So rather than um, a kind of focus which has often, um, often been um, the, the central feature of a lot of research on, on whether or not seafarers are more mentally healthy than other groups or you know, whether their mental health is deteriorating or improving, um, all of which are legitimate questions, but all of which are very difficult to research in the shipping industry. Um, we thought we would just simply try to find out from seafarers, well, what would, what would uh, we have to do to actually make um, uh, your mental health and well-being on board better? Um, and what sorts of things happen on board 
um, or what sorts of things uh, you know don't exist on board, which which mean that your mental health, you feel your mental health um, suffers. So we took that approach, um, and we we at the end of it all, we wanted to actually um, address the question of of what policies and practices could actually be implemented by um, ship operators and welfare bodies um, to provide better support for mental health um, and, and well-being on board. One of the things that we knew at the beginning of the research is that a lot of the recommendations that were out there at the time seemed to be self-help sort of strategies. And we wanted to know whether that was um, the best thing to, to, to be doing or whether there was more that could be done um, in relation to supporting seafarers' mental health and well-being. Um, if we could have the next slide, that would be great, Jason. Thank you. Um, we did a very comprehensive piece of research. We're very fun, very fortunate to be um, funded by the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health in the UK, um, and um, and they funded a, a comprehensive study, um, which was very helpful. We undertook a literature of review of all the grey literature. That is to say, non-academic literature, the kind of um, uh, literature that was in the in in, in the public domain uh, around the industry, um, looking at seafarers' mental health, um, and that was partly to inform us in relation to the views and attitudes of stakeholders. Um, we interviewed a small number of employers and welfare organisations. Um, we conducted semi-structured interviews with claims handlers and key personnel um, from eleven of the thirteen main PI clubs. Now I'm guessing that the audience here knows what PI clubs are, but um, I know you're recording, Jason. So if I just add that PI clubs are, are the sort of insurers that um, insure vessels and and um, and personnel on on board against ill health and so forth, the repatriation costs that go with uh, ill health, including mental ill health, and the costs associated with suicide. So they're they're very um, involved in any kind of serious cases of um, uh, ill health or um, welfare on board vessels. So we did 13, 13 PI clubs constitute the International PI uh, Club group, and um, uh, we did interviews with 11 of those. So we pretty much were able to cover all of them, really. Um, we analysed the results uh, of a randomly um, distributed questionnaire. Um, uh, that's not that sounds that sounds wrong actually. We and we analysed the results of a questionnaire that was sent to a random sample is what I meant to say of HR managers uh, in ship operating companies, and um, uh, we we had forty three questionnaires returned to us um, uh, out of out of the um, uh, the seventy odd that we sent out, and we looked at um, uh, seafarers themselves and we conducted. A, over 1,500, just over 1,500 interviewer administered questionnaires. The difference between a self-complete questionnaire and an interviewer administered questionnaire is that with an interviewer administered questionnaire, a researcher actually stands with the, the um, participant and, and completes the questionnaire for them, which means that um, if there's any areas of, the, you know, of, of where clarity is lacking, um, the, the interviewer can actually explain what the question means. And so you get a much more valid um, response. People understand exactly what they're being asked and they can give much better uh, answers. And then we actually did um, a few semi-structured interviews with, with seafarers. Um, we also, of course, did an academic literature review as is, is normally the case. Um, and we did some interviews with stakeholders um, and employers, um, about five, five, five in each um, group. Um, and and through that process, coming at it in different directions, we were able to develop a very sort of rounded understanding, I think, of um, both the problem and um, the potential solutions to the problem from a seafarer's perspective, from HR managers' perspectives, and from um, people like yourselves, um, the audience here, um, uh, stakeholders and welfare organizations from their perspective too. If we could move to the next slide, please, Jason, that'd be great. Um, the, the literature, um, from the literature, we learned um, several things, really. Um, when, we, when we look at the academic literature and when we look at the grey literature, um, and indeed when we went to PI clubs and looked at their data, 
um, we found that it was impossible to say um, that um, seafarers' mental health was getting worse um, in general, um, in particular in relation to suicide and repatriation. So very serious cases of um, mental ill health. There was no clear evidence of a worsening situation. Um, now part of, part of the reason for that is, is that you, you can't conclude from that that there is evidence that the situation is stable or that there is evidence that things are improving. And part of the reason why we couldn't um, say whether the situation was worsening or not is because there is no clear evidence to say what the situation is. Um, and that's because it's very, very difficult um, to construct rates of mental ill health in the shipping industry. To know a rate, you have to know A, the numbers of something, like the suicides, numbers of suicides, but then you have to know the population that that comes from. So um, even amongst PI clubs, for example, who are good sources of data on repatriations and suicides, um, they would know how many suicides cases they'd, they'd had in a certain period, say in tenure period, but they would have no idea how many seafarers their members employed in that period. So you can't construct a rate, you can't know that one in a hundred seafarers um, uh, have become ill um, or, have, or, or have gone missing, um, or one in a hundred thousand. You just simply can't know what the rate is. And if you don't have a rate, you can't tell over time as those numbers fluctuate, um, uh, whether things are getting worse or better. So although there was this clear concern in the, you know, across the industry um, and more talk about mental health issues and shipping, um, it didn't seem to be coming from um, statistics that told us or tell us um, that the situation is, is getting worse, um, except um, in, in a very small number of um, cases. So um, actually at the Seafarers International Research Center, we have done research which indicates um, that for um, recent onset psychiatric disorders, which are of relatively minor nature, like anxiety and short term depression, um, because we've been able to go on, uh, because we've been able to go to active seafarers while they're on board ships, um, usually when they've just come ashore for a few hours or whatever, and do questionnaires with them. Um, which, which assess their mental health in terms of anxiety and short-term depression. Um, we were able to do that twice over a five-year period. And, and in fact, we did find that the data indicated that there were more problems um, of uh, recent onset psychiatric disorders um, uh, now than previously. Um, so so that, that seemed to be the case and that's been confirmed subsequently by um, research um, undertaken on behalf of the ITF that you may be familiar with, um, undertaken by Raphael Lefkowitz, um, uh, uh, which also supports that same conclusion, really, that they're, they're, in terms of these less severe mental health problems, um, uh, there seems to be some indication, actually some real data that indicates that there, there is an increasing problem. Um, <clears throat> There's also evidence that in general, this is in the literature, the academic literature, in general, um, mental health problems are higher among seafarers than non-seafarers. Um, that literature is quite um, patchy, but, um, but I think it's sensible to conclude from it overall that there is um, a generally higher rate of mental health problems among seafarers than non-seafarers. Um, and taken in the round, I think that suggests really that it is appropriate for industry stakeholders to be concerned about the issue. And in actual fact, um, they probably should have been concerned about it some time ago. So I, I don't think that we can say that um, there's been a sudden increase, and neither do we know whether there's been a decrease or, 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 or stabilization um, in terms of serious mental ill health and shipping. One thing that we do know is that seafarers um, who have serious problems on board often will cover them up, will ask to be repatriated on other grounds with the full collusion uh, of, of their senior officers in many cases, um, who appreciate that, you know, um, if they were found to have a very serious mental health problem that could jeopardize the whole of their career. So often they'll say that they've got a, a death at home or some other kind of problem they have to return to if they realize that they're experiencing very serious mental ill health on board. They also get screened out 
um, in the pre-employment medical examinations um, uh, from going on board in the first place. And so that's why I think that uh, one reason why you wouldn't necessarily expect um, an increase in problems to manifest itself on board, it might be that you would need to look at the seafarer population ashore to, to find that. So it's a very complex situation. Um, but on the whole, I think the picture is that, that we, we can't conclude anything too much about severe mental Ill health and whether it's increasing or not. But we do know that more minor psychiatric disorders like anxiety and depression are increasing and that there is a general problem um, in this industry that needs to be addressed and is overdue for consideration. So if we could have the next slide, please, Jason. <coughs> From our primary research, that's the actual interviews and questionnaires and so on that we went out to do. Um, we, we were surprised to find initially that many employers actually didn't see mental ill health as a problem on board. So um, in the, you know, in the press, there was a lot of things being written about um, the mental health situation for seafarers, a lot of concern being expressed by different um, bodies and charities um, and the PI clubs. But many employers actually said that no they didn't see that there was any um, worsening problem and they didn't see that they needed to be proactive in relation to this matter. At first we were quite surprised about that but we did ask employers some detailed questions about what their experiences were of deaths on board for example suicides on board um, and what their experiences were of repatriations and many employers um, weren't registering an increase in problems and I think it's often the increase in problems that triggers a kind of concern and action um, rather than employers necessarily thinking to themselves, well, this is a long-standing problem. We do have suicides from time to time. We do have missing people that turn out to be suicide cases. Um, you know, this is something we should be more concerned about. Um, I think because it isn't a problem that was, you know, dramatically increasing for many employers, it, it was being overlooked. Um, however, one or two um, employers indicated both in the questionnaire and in the interviews that they really believed it was a very important issue. Um, they really wanted to be proactive rather than reactive in addressing um, seafarers mental health um, and, and improving seafarers mental health. Um, and, and they had a really interesting perspective on how um, you could do that in a very holistic way, not just looking at reactive measures, but looking at all sorts of proactive things that could be done. Um, we found that although um, you know most seafarers cope astonishingly well, um, I, I'm always so amazed at their resilience and impressed by the way that they deal with everyday challenges of being on board ships. Um, so they cope incredibly well being at sea, otherwise they wouldn't be able to keep going back to sea as they do. Um, but nevertheless, they are significantly more, uh, more likely to feel happy at home than at sea. Um, and that was an overwhelming um, finding. They're also much more likely to feel um, lonely on board um, than when they're ashore. And, and you might think that sounds kind of like, well, not surprising really, but actually a lot of us do get on very well with our work colleagues and there is a strong sense of solidarity on board some ships and um, uh, seafarers spend maybe nine months out of 12 at sea. So to be, you know, quite a lot more lonely um, at sea than ashore is, is a significant uh, thing um, to experience. And also it has to be said that because seafarers are away from their homes and their communities for so much time, they do describe to us being disconnected from community life ashore over time. So it wouldn't be all that surprising to find that seafarers were rather lonely at home um, in actual fact. But notwithstanding that fact, they are significantly more lonely at sea. Um, if we can have the next slide, please, Jason. So when we talked um, to seafarers, um, we, we talked to them about the sorts of things that made them happy and unhappy, um, uh, the kinds of um, uh, things that they thought would improve um, their levels of happiness on board. Um, and uh, they identified a range of things um, that could be done to, to, to make them feel better um, on board ships. Um, one, one, one thing that was uh, uh, highlighted was that actually, you know, better work leave balance, work life balance um, and work leave balance um, would, would improve um, their mental health significantly. 
um, there has been talk in the past amongst companies of how seafarers actually like longer contracts on board. Um, and, and it's true that if you think this might be the only job you ever land um, because you're on a short term contract and you're desperate for the money, um, you probably would prefer a longer uh, contract on board. Um, but where seafarers are repeatedly going to sea and then going home and then going to sea again, and they have some job security, even if it's not a permanent job, um, they have some confidence that they will go back to the same company. Um, they generally express a desire for shorter periods of time on board. Um, and of course, the better the salary is, the, the, the more they can afford leave time at home. Um, and, and what we found is that, that seafarers um, from European countries, largely, who've ended up in positions where they end up with a kind of 50-50, surely short you know, time at home and, and um, time on board, um, that really works well for them. And they're actually perfectly content often with that, with that arrangement. So a better work-life balance would really um, improve things for seafarers. Um, anything that actually helps sustain their relationships, their family and friends ashore, prevents them from becoming distant from their home communities and from their loved ones, um, is incredibly valuable to seafarers. Um, and it was absolutely a priority for them to have free internet access on board. Um, it's, it's, it's totally invaluable, irreplaceable. Um, and unfortunately, still not universally um, provided on, on board ships. Um, interestingly, um, seafarers talked about um, the things that would improve shipboard relationships on board. So bigger crews, more social activities. One of the number one things that they identified as making them happy was after going home was, um, was actually being able to go um, to take short breaks of shore leave uh, with their colleagues. Um, in port, something which, of course, we know people can't do at the moment, and it, and it must be a, a, a great, uh, be having a terribly negative effect, I think, on people's mental well-being on board. Um, but anything that allows them to socialise together on board, um, uh, sort of communal sports activities, parties, barbecues, um, being able to go ashore with your colleagues, all these things are critical in improving shipboard uh, relationships. Um, also things to do with, um, uh, you know, addressing bullying and, and problems of that nature, anything to actually make um, life on board more harmonious uh, really would have a, a big impact. Um, and they talked a lot about better recreational um, facilities. Uh, as we know, I don't know, I guess some of you have been looking at the Ever Given stuck in the Panama Canal. Whenever I see those huge container ships, um, and I look at where the accommodation space is in the middle of all those containers. And I know what it's like to walk on those container ships where you, you can't walk on top of the containers. You're only ever walking underneath them. Um, and so your access to the kind of outside space is limited to the bridge, the bridge wing, if you're allowed up there. <coughs> and this kind of corridor underneath the containers. And it is the most horribly confined um, uh, kind of experience. Uh, and, and to make more and more space for the cargo, companies have reduced the accommodation space available so that facilities that were once on board, like I've been on ships, older ships, with indoor swimming pools, with squash courts, with big full size basketball courts inside. Um, all these kinds of facilities um, have tended to, to go over the last 20 years. Um, and these spaces that are available um, for seafarers have got smaller and smaller. Um, in addition, company rules like banning alcohol, banning barbecues, banning sports activities because seafarers might get injured. All of these things have, have come and gone to an extent. Some have stayed and some have kind of like come and then disappeared again. Um, but they, they also limit obviously the social activities that can happen on board. Um, with, with, with really negative consequences, I think. If we could have the next slide, please, Trace. <clears throat> Interestingly, now, um, I, I think at the beginning, I mentioned that we had noticed that across the sector, one of the things that was being encouraged a lot was reactive self-help strategies. I mean, I think that's partly because a lot of the people who wanted to help with this situation uh, were limited in what they could offer. So. Um, apps to encourage seafarers um, to, to, to engage in activities that would 
help with their mental health and their physical health, um, uh, a suggestion to put counselling services in place. Um, these sorts of things, which are very laudable, and I don't doubt do improve um, things for people um, to an extent, um, were never really mentioned by seafarers or hardly ever mentioned by seafarers. Um, <coughs> seafarers were much more um, enthusiastic about um, trying to prevent problems arising in the first place. Um, and they recognized that, um, now how did I, I heard a, 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 psycho a psychologist at a conference on international maritime health um, uh, say once, it's all very well having a, you know, um, throwing, having a life ring and throwing it to a, a, a drowning man or teaching a drowning man to, teaching a seafarer to swim. But at the end of the day, they'd still rather have um, the, the life ring to, uh, to, to, to rescue them or a, a RNLI lifeboat in the UK to come out and rescue them. Um, that there's only so much you can do for yourself in every situation, in every condition. Um, you will find that you you go under effectively um, uh, in certain circumstances. We're all humans and we all have that kind of breaking point and far better to try to um, mitigate um, uh, the, the, the situation before you get to that breaking point than it is to try and sort of stick a sticking plaster on uh, afterwards. So I'm um, sorry about all those mixed metaphors going on there, but I think you get the gist of what I'm trying to say. Um, so they, they actually, you know, uh, talk very much about proactive things. Um, they themselves, so it's not a response to us asking direct questions about would you prefer this or would you prefer this? We just allowed seafarers to speak about what would help them. And they did not come up with these things such as counselling um, or more apps to tell them how to protect their mental health. Um, but they did come up with the, the other things that I've mentioned already. Um, if we could maybe go to the next slide, um, Jason, please. So from the research, we made a number of recommendations. Um, we think it's very important that um, companies and stakeholders um, do actually address the significant difference that we identified between the levels of happiness when they're on board and when they're at home. And I just think it's important that um, that, that situation is addressed regardless of whether or not we have hard data on whether seafarers' mental health is deteriorating or improving. In a way, that's not actually the point. The point is that the conditions on board um, are not tolerable, really, um, for humans long term, and they should be improved. Um, that we would like companies and stakeholders to be aware of and reactive to um, the fact that there is evidence that recent onset psychological disorders are increasing amongst serving seafarers and that that's likely to be a, a, a result of the context they're working in, more pressure, more stress, less shore leave. I'm sure at the moment it's, you know, I hope now it's reduced a bit, but certainly in the early stages of the pandemic, I'm sure that was a really significant um, uh, problem on board. The companies and stakeholders should actually uh, recognise the importance of mental health and well-being in the cargo shipping industry. I think there are still too many who simply don't want to talk about the issue. It's really not the priority for them. Um, uh, and, and that they should recognise that there's always something they could do. So some employers in our survey said things like, well, there's no room for facilities for seafarers. I mean, this is a cargo ship. It is a cargo ship. There's a cargo ship where choices are made about what provision is made. It's not a cargo ship where you couldn't possibly have a swimming pool. We know that's not true because there are cargo ships with swimming pools. So, you know, these are choices that are being made and it's just about priorities. And, and people need to be put back at the, at the front of the queue in terms of prioritization. Um, and we, we would like companies to recognize that actually, you know, it is, it is an easy option to, to perhaps uh, buy into an app or a counseling service or um, uh, provide some minor training support for seafarers on board. But at the end of the day, they really need to proactively do more on board to improve living and working conditions for seafarers. Um, in order to uh, address mental health, um, uh, ill men mental health on board. Perhaps we could go to the last two slides then, Jason, I think. Um, so very quickly running through the practical things that we felt were minimal, really. Um, I know a lot of companies would look at them and think they were excessive, but we felt they were um, the minimum requirements, really. We believe 
that free and unlimited internet access is absolutely essential for seafarers um, on board in relation to mental health, mental, good mental health. Um, that there should be a varied menu of interactive recreational activities um, on board for seafarers. Um, and they should combine, we should, we should have recreational activities which are available for a whole group. And we should have recreational activities which people tend to do alone. So people tend to use the gym on their own. That's no good for actually promoting social interaction, um, but basketball. So a, a, a varied menu. And that's because not everybody is the same. We don't all like playing the same games. We don't all like playing the same, doing the same things. So you need to have at least two or three activities to, to give the good possibility that the things you're providing are going to benefit um, everybody on board. Comfortable mattresses is something that the MLC is supposed to um, guarantee, but um, uh, unfortunately um, they're not um, readily available on board. Very important in terms of reducing fatigue so that seafarers are, better, are in better mental um, shape. Shore leave, of course, absolute um, key issue at the moment, but shore leave really should be provided at every opportunity for all ranks. It's absolutely essential. Um, food is incredibly important. There's always talk in the industry about the importance of food. Um, but food is one of the things that does get squeezed. The galley crews have been reduced, so there's less time uh, uh, for the chief cooks to make interesting varied menus for seafarers. Provisioning is often squeezed as well um, in terms of the rate, the allocated rate per dollar rate per person on board. And ships often have to cater for all sorts of port personnel coming on board their ships. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not just... Um, uh, one or two welcome visitors that they provide food to um, in the course of their voyages. They, they, they provide food to all sorts of agents and um, inspectors and loading masters and, you know, all kinds of short personnel. And the last slide, I think it is Jason, next to, ne next to the last slide. Um, we still think that self-help guidance on improving mental resilience should be provided to seafarers. We're not suggesting for a minute it shouldn't. Um, so we think that's important still. Um, and we think it's absolutely vital that companies move back towards balancing work and leave time. We know that some companies moved towards that um, in terms of ratings. I think um, you know, some of the big companies actually improved the work um, leave time balance for ratings uh, a year or two ago, and then seem to reverse that situation, which is very sad to see. Um, we think anti-bullying and harassment policies um, uh, come out of the research as being quite important for seafarers in creating a positive atmosphere on board. And, you know, more could be done to actually train officers, um, senior officers, as part of their basic training and management training. Um, more could be done to actually train them um, in how to create a positive atmosphere on, on board, um, including sort of, you know, praising good work and, and being respectful with subordinates and so forth. Um, and then finally, Jason, if we go to the last slide, please. This is just details of um, where you can find out more about CERC on the CERC website, um, where you can find out more about the full uh, research report, which is a bit overwhelming, but, uh, but you're very welcome to look at it if you, um, if you feel it's worth investigating. And then, um, as Jason mentioned, uh, the paper, which kind of summarizes some of these things in Maritime policy and management um, has been published, and the details, the details in there. It's always very strange when you're doing a webinar, and uh, you, you feel like you're just talking into this kind of abyss. And I don't think I'm terribly brilliant at that, but um, I hope I managed to get across to you um, the essentials as a research and the main things that we felt came out of it. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sampson, for that overview of your uh, wider research uh, project. Uh, there's so much in this presentation to unpack, and uh, I'd like to uh, ask some questions myself, but there's already been a few questions that have come in. And uh, I encourage any of you that have questions now to pop them into the question uh, box, and uh, uh, we can get to them. We have enough time. Uh, we still have a, a little bit over 20 minutes uh, to, uh, to, to go through some questions. Uh, and so if you have any burning questions that you want to ask, now's the time. One question came in from Patty Saracen, who is uh, an administrator with the Montreal Ministry of Seafarers in Montreal, Canada. 
uh, uh, just a clarification question, and then she had a bigger question after that. Can you clarify the difference between your interviewer administered questionnaire and then the semi-structured interviews? What, what, what's the difference between those two things? Sure. So an interviewer administered questionnaire is really a series of set kinds of questions. Um, they can be closed questions and open questions, but the questions don't really change from, uh, from participant to participant. So if I uh, do an interview administered a questionnaire with you, uh, Patty, it would be the same as the uh, questionnaire that I do with Jason. Um, a semi-structured interview is a more flexible instrument um, uh, and it would be a face-to-face -face recorded conversation really, um, which is guided by a series of kinds of uh, questions, but they're more like subheadings for the interviewer. So the interviewer knows in advance that what they want to, to ask about is A, B, C, D, um, but they, they deliver the interview in a very uh, flexible and responsive way. So depending on your answer, um, you know, I might then ask a few more questions about A before moving on to B, um, or I might move straight on to B, but it's, it's a much more flexible instrument that's much more responsive to what the individual says. So it's more like a conversation and the interview administered questionnaire is exactly like the kind of questionnaire that you're familiar with, the self-complete, except that instead of completing it yourself, an interviewer actually takes you through the questions, like a market research exercise, um, if you've ever done one of those. And, and if you didn't understand the question, you can ask the, the, um, the interviewer, well, what, what exactly does that mean? And they can explain it some more. And they're the ones who actually record your answers as well. So um, if you give an ambiguous answer, for example, they have the capacity then to record that in some way. Um, so, so, you know, a, a questionnaire is very fixed. An interview administered questionnaire is pretty fixed, um, but with some capacity to, to explain questions and to maybe make notes uh, as it's undertaken by the researcher. Uh, and a, a, a semi-structured interview is very flexible and much more like a conversation. So a follow-up question, this one by Patty, but also asked in a uh, sort of in a in a different way uh, by Mark Mark Wadka down in Canaveral. Uh, two parts to this: one is when was your research actually done, and uh, the uh, the subsequent question will be: well, then what did the pandemic do uh, <laughs> because of it? So when when was your research uh, mostly done for the main project? So I would say that most of it took place in 2018. I think the project might have started just into 2017, and then we finished it in 2019. But I would say the bulk of the research activity was in 2018-19, um, just before the pandemic, really. So we published the final report in November, I think, 2019. Um, and then, you know, over here in the UK, we were in lockdown in March 2020, weren't we? So the pandemic was kind of kicking off, actually, but we just didn't really know it straight away. Um, so th then the two questions, one from Mark Wadka down in Canaveral, uh, there was a lot of news on cruise ship worker suicides at the beginning of the pandemic. And then Patty Saracen asked uh, if this research was conducted before the pandemic. If so, is there any evidence that COVID-19 has negatively impacted the mental health of seafarers? So um, this was before the pandemic. Um, the, the, the problem of the research, of any research, is establishing rates. So it's really hard to make comparisons um, between mental health um, uh, of seafarers at any given point in time and a later point in time. Um, it is difficult to do. Um, uh, so far, uh, it's particularly difficult to do if you can't get access to those seafarers whilst they're on board, which of course is the situation during the pandemic. Researchers can't access um, those seafarers because they're not coming ashore. Um, even for shore leave. Um, so it's very difficult to therefore run something like a general health questionnaire, uh, 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 set of questions um, with seafarers to find out using a validated instrument whether or not you can see whether short-term anxiety has increased, for example. It's, 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 it's something that can be done under normal circumstances but can't really be done during the pandemic. So hard evidence in that way, um, it's, A, it's hard to come by anyway, um, in normal circumstances and b what can be done in normal circumstances can't be done during the pandemic so hard evidence of that kind just isn't available 
However, I do think that, you know, our research indicates many of the things which support um, seafarers' mental health, many of the things that make seafarers feel good and better, um, many of the things that seafarers identify as helping them to uh, improve their mental resilience, you know, what do they do to make themselves feel better if they're feeling down, many of those things are simply not available on board anymore. Um, so shore leave is, is case in point. It's so critical. I can't tell you what it's like having been, you know, I've done research on ships um, and I, I think my longest voyage was 42 days. Uh, but even in that time, which is relatively short compared to the contracts seafarers are serving, you know, to be able to set foot and walk freely on land um, amongst green vegetation and, you know, just to be able to walk um, rather than being confined on this noisy, um, dirty, clanging, clashing, moving ship is so critical to your mental well-being and mental health. So, and seafarers identify that too. Um, and, and so the fact that they haven't been able to do um, something as simple as walk on the shore freely is absolutely, you know, I don't think it, it I don't think it's a, a big jump to make an assumption that that's going to negatively impact on their mental health and well-being. Um, and, and I think seafarers' subjective experiences and, and what they've said about the impact of the pandemic makes it clear that they have been suffering um, from a mental health point of view. Um, often people are really desperate to have objective measures of things. I think um, when it comes to mental health and well-being, we're all pretty good at knowing um, what is making us feel bad and what is making us feel better. And, you know, there's no reason why we shouldn't trust um, seafarers, I think, in this respect, in terms of talking about the impact of the pandemic. After all, we kind of trust ourselves. You know, I read in the paper all the time about the negative impact that the pandemic is having on people ashore, but I don't think it's based on, you know, evidence that's being collected by researchers. It's it's what people are saying, it's what people are feeling, what people are talking about. So, um, so the answer is kind of, yes, I think there is evidence, but it probably isn't the kind of evidence um, you know, that a lot of ship companies might be looking for or wanting to, to, to see before they accept it. I hope that answers the question. Uh, a question from uh, two, and I'm sure there's more people that have the same kind of question. Uh, Sylvie Boyd uh, yeah, writes, isn't the unlimited access to the internet Wi-Fi in opposition to social interactive activities? Captain told me that since they have internet for free on board, most of his crew does not stay as long as before when they're uh, having a team barbecue because they want to Skype back to their family. Mark Wadka also says, I heard that unlimited internet across US Mariners is resulting in adverse social consequences among crew since they become absorbed in social media and spend less time together. Uh, how would you react to these kind of comments? Okay, so I, 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 I have heard the same things. They come up very often and I, I totally, um, I totally fail to recognize that. So having, having been on board ships where they have internet and where they don't ha have internet, um, uh, I think the first thing to say is that actually there's a limited amount of time that you can spend talking to people back at home. So e even as a researcher myself, so I, I, I would go on board a ship and be so pleased to have internet access and I would Skype home if, if the connection was good enough um, and, um, and be talking to people who were even interested in the research that I was doing on board, you know, could really relate to what I was doing. So I had plenty uh, on, the, on the face of it to talk about. But ship life is incredibly tedious and monotonous when nothing else is happening. And actually after a time, um, it becomes more and more difficult to sustain um, kind of prolonged social interaction with people ashore. You become, you know, more distant from them. Now, if you think that often a seafarer uh, has nothing of interest in terms of his work or her work to, to share back at home. I mean, very few partners um, would be expected to be interested in the fact that the seafarer stripped down a, a pump today or, you know, that they were chipping rust on the deck or, or washing the, you know, there's not that much to say about it. So in those circumstances, actually, um, uh, things can get pretty um, limited in terms of, you know, the to and fro of of social interaction and, and seafarers um, really enjoy having occasions and things that have happened, so, you know, things that happen, things that make them laugh, things that um, to actually talk with their families back home about. 
Um, and and it, it really isn't the case that seafarers, in my experience, or from what they tell us, um, will shun uh, collective activities on board for the internet. What has happened is that literally the spaces, the rooms, the size of the rooms, the facilities, the resources for people to do things together that once would be considered as fun um, uh, have gone. So if you don't have um, those opportunities, those spaces, if you're not allowed um, to drink alcohol for safety reasons, which may be very wise in some respects, but probably isn't very good for social interaction on the other hand, if a barbecue party happens once in four or five weeks, um, if at all, um, these, 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 these things are being squeezed and the internet is kind of like a lifeline really, but um, it becomes a much a uh, more positive interaction that you can have at home if you have interesting things to talk about. Otherwise, what tends to happen to most seafarers, I think, is they just become like a bit of a repository for the family problems and the family life. Um, but there's nothing really going going back. It's much healthier in any relationship as there's a bit of a two way flow going on. So I, I, I think it's something that companies often will say or people in companies who are somehow resistant to giving seafarers the Internet for whatever reasons they have will say but there's nothing that we've seen that indicates that one is responsible for the other, that the internet is responsible for lack of social interaction. It, on, on ships where there's no internet access, we've still seen an introduction, a, a, a reduction in the amount of social interaction um, because those spaces, those facilities, the time, um, all of those things have, have gone. Um, just, just the impact on the galley crew of reducing the galley crew so the galley crew, once when I when I first went on board ships, once upon a time they would have time to bake cakes for people's birthdays, to make uh, buns for break time, you know, doing something as simple as that creates a kind of a momentary reprieve from the boredom and monotony of, of being at sea and gets people to talk and interact. Um, but if there's no time for the cook to do that, then that occasion just simply or that. Uh, opportunity for an occasion just simply evaporates and in my experience of going on board over the last 20 years I would say that increasingly ships have become more and more about um, uh, work and work and work and less and less about any kind of sense of adventure or having fun or um, uh, you know camaraderie on board. Next question is a, a sort of pair of questions again, one from uh, Reverend Judith Altry uh, in uh, Toronto in Canada. Fear of not, get it, not getting hired or rehired might prevent a seafarer from actively seeking counseling, but might bring them to ask a chaplain or other seafarer welfare worker for assistance with mental health issues. Is this a reasonable assumption? And if so, how can we be proactively uh, helping or being watchful of the mental health of seafarers we meet? Then a second question from uh, Robert Marsh Draghi in New York City. It, it would seem that reactive responses to the welfare of seafarers, and is this the sort of work that chaplains do, uh, would be less important than proactive conditions on the ships themselves, yet still necessary for the care of seafarers. Do you have any ideas on how welfare workers can facilitate more confidential counseling while seafarers are on shore leave and or while being visited by a welfare worker? First of all, can I say it's very nice to hear a question from uh, Reverend Judith, um, and uh, 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 so I'm very happy to know that she's still there in Toronto, and uh, I remember meeting her there, and that was a, a great day. Um, I, um, I think um, it, is, it is extremely fair to say that seafarers um, are afraid of, uh, of revealing mental uh, health problems on board and that therefore any kind of um, uh, chaplain um, who comes on board or who invites seafarer to a welfare centre um, uh, becomes critical, really. Um, I, I lost the... Jason, could you just stick the question back up the front for me um, to make sure that I don't uh, go, go too far off track? Yeah, um, I don't know if I... I don't know how, if I can uh, put it back up. I took it away from you too, uh, too quickly. Okay. Sorry. It's not, uh, is it under answered questions? Yes, maybe? it's under answered, yes. And you can't, no, we can't see that tab. Um, I can, but you can't, I don't think. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, okay. Um, so I think the question, if I remember rightly, from both people, 
uh, was actually to do with what you know can chaplains do and how can um, uh, we do more to support seafarers in those circumstances. Um, and I, I think one of the issues that seafarers have is, is short, as you know, is very brief periods of time ashore. Um, where ships uh, come in and out of port and chaplains are able to develop um, relationships with crews on particular ships, you know, they know, I think that that's all for the good and is, is going to encourage um, seafarers to, um, you know, to be able to open up with, with, with problems when they, when they have them. Um, because obviously the better the personal relationship is, um, the more likely that is to happen. Um, I think maybe the internet has a role to play. I've talked to people in, in the Apostleship of the Sea over here in the UK who've talked about trying to back up some of the chaplaincy work with a kind of in, internet access to chats and discussions with chaplains. So a combination of kind of meeting people, but then actually being there online to kind of support them um, uh, can be helpful. Um, I also think that, you know, we recently did a project um, on, on um, seafarer centers and port chaplains, and um, it was a different project. But what we saw there was that often seafarer centers are very busy places, and it isn't necessarily the case that a seafarer will come in and know where to find a chaplain. I mean, they might find a volunteer um, selling snacks or whatever, but, you know, to actually know where they might find somebody um, is, is, is difficult. Um, and I know with resource, um, resourcing problems um, that this solution isn't really um, likely to be possible. But I suppose ideally it would be great if there was a kind of a, you know, a, a, a room where there was somebody available um, to seafarers where they would know that if they happen to go and knock on that particular door, that that's where they'd find a chaplain or a counsellor or somebody who could be, be of help to them um, if they were in uh, distress. I suppose the only other thing would be maybe some sort of facility where ahead of calling into a port, they might be able to notify somebody that they'd like to have a conversation. I do think that ship visits, although they're terribly important, um, and, and maybe you can tell me that I'm wrong and actually they generate huge opportunities, but all the ship visits that I've accompanied and when I've been on board and there have been visits from chaplains um, ashore, the nature of the public nature of the, the visit and the fact that seafarers are working really, um, I think they're all very constraining in terms of anybody having a chance to open up about any problems. Um, so I don't know if I caught the second, do you think I answered the second question in that as well, Jason? I think so, but there's other questions right behind them that are uh, sort of overlapping. Uh, one from Richard Farrell, uh, do you see any seasonal variation among seafarers? Certainly in where I'm from here in Montreal and Canada, there's uh, the, the feelings of mental health vary season by season. Is this something that seafarers uh, experience at all? That's an interesting question. I suppose if, if seafarers are working in the Great Lakes or something like that, you, you, well, they'd probably only be doing that in the, in the more clement seasons. Um, so maybe they'd be less affected by um, mental health problems caused by um, seasonal affective disorder. Um, I think that um, most seafarers are sort of uh, traversing, you know, um, latitudes and longitudes and, um, and therefore sort of passing from season to season. Uh, I think it would be very difficult to, to know whether there's a seasonal um, uh, effect unless you just focused on a population of seafarers that were in domestic waters. Our researchers tend to be in international um, uh, shipping. So I, I think that's just a question I probably can't answer really. I'm not sure if there would be um, an effect, um, but I suppose we're all humans, so um, there's no reason to imagine there wouldn't be. But I think with international seafarers, they're just passing, you know, you're, you're in the Arctic, um, uh, or the subarctic sort of uh, one week and three weeks later you're in the tropics so it's it's kind of difficult to, to assess really. Next question from uh, came in via chat from uh, Captain Margaret Reasoner who said I heard you recommended that training for senior officers on how to create a positive work environment would help. Uh, what kind of resources are available on that to uh, topic? Is there training available? I don't think that there's any um, take up of that sort of thing or 
um, expressed interest in that sort of thing amongst companies at all, really. Um, I may be doing some of them a disservice, um, certainly in the kind of um, uh, training that happens in maritime colleges. I think that sort of thing gets very little attention. Um, I know there's a certain amount of resistance amongst some um, senior officers um, to being asked to do that kind of training because, you know, they feel quite reasonably that they have so much on their plate already that, you know, why on earth would I have to do that kind of training? But in actual fact, I think where it is done, um, it has hugely positive effect on, on not only the lives of the subordinate seafarers, but actually as a result on the life of the senior officers as well. So I think it's well worth the investment, but I think at the moment there's very little investment going on in that kind of thing. We're coming up to the end of our hour, but we still got lots of questions to go. So some of them will uh, remain unanswered. I'll try to package a, a few of them together. One from Leila Semsi, uh, another from Christy Chapman. Do you see any developments or progress since you published your research? And then uh, that was the first question. And Christy Chapman, what's the response to the research by ship owners and agents, especially given the costs involved in redesign of ship, ships or equip, uh, equipment uh, or free Wi-Fi? What is the response since you published your articles and your research? Yeah, I mean, in general, I mean, when I presented the research, which you'll appreciate because of the pandemic, we've had limited opportunity to present the research um, to, to ship operators, but I have presented it to a um, conference of um, ship operators and, and actually received quite a positive response to the presentation. Um, that's rather different to the companies rushing off and changing um, things that they do. I mean, one of the problems is that long, long term, um, uh, you know, some of these, some of these changes need to be about changing the design of a ship, which is a very long term issue. Um, short term things that can be done tend to get a better response. What's interesting is during the pandemic, I was approached by um, a couple of companies asking for advice about how best to support um, seafarers welfare on board. And I did hear from them that they had already looked at our research and I dare say, you know, they've already consulted amongst their own, um, uh, you know, um, personnel. Um, but they had done things like introduce better and faster connectivity where they had it on board already or introduce free connectivity for the first time or um, and also focused on things like food. So I think that possibly in the pandemic, the, the research has been helpful to companies because they've been incentivized to try to do a bit more to try to support their seafarers. And I just have to hope that those things kind of are ongoing. On the other hand, I know that companies have also <coughs> done something which I think um, is probably a bit misguided, um, but done, you know, I'm sure from, from the right sort of sentiments, but they have encouraged social distancing on board ships um, and felt that that's necessary. And I actually think that, that that must be making life even more difficult on board than it, than it was previously, because it obviously it increases that distance between seafarers and places more barriers between them at a time when they actually can't go ashore and can't do some of the things that they really need to do to improve their mental health and well-being. So um, I think the response is not negative, is not aggressive or hostile, um, but um, you know, it's this, it's this constant uh, conundrum that we're always up against really, is that you know, to do these things costs money and it may well save companies money in the long term. And it you know, is bound to do good things in terms of their retention of seafarers and keeping skilled people and all the things that we know, but actually demonstrating a bottom line effect of that is really difficult. And it's much, it's much, you see much more clearly the cost of doing those things. And so often the argument gets lost in that, in that way, really, that we know that it costs so much to have comfortable, comfortable mattresses. And we don't know yet because we didn't yet have an accident that, you know, was directly a mattress was pointed to as the direct cause of it. Um, so even, even though it makes perfect sense, if you're sleeping on a mattress with great big springs that are sticking into you, as I have on board one um, modern ship recently, um, you're not going to sleep well. And if you're not sleeping well, you're tired. And if you're tired, you're more likely to make mistakes. We all know those things. And yet still somehow, you know, there's, there's a feeling that until the problem really 
kind of clearly manifests itself and, and forces it its way into your attention that it can be brushed under the carpet. And after all, to, to, to pay for these things, um, you know, the cost is so obvious and, and, um, and yeah, irresistible really in terms of, or totally resistible in terms of actually spending your, your money. Um, so, yeah. Thank you so much. We still had questions from uh, Dr. Amos Kuji and from uh, uh, Deacon Paul Rosenblum and a few others, but we have come up to the end of our hour. Thank you so very much, Professor Sampson, for your presentation today. It's been uh, great to hear from you, and I thank you for this time. Thank you very much, and yeah, I really appreciate all the, um, the questions, and sorry we didn't get